Anybody glad to be at church today? Come on, let's put our hands together. If you're watching online or inside of the prisons, we're going to invite you to sing along with us. Oh, faith of a mustard seed can move the mountains. And one simple offering can feed the thousands. It don't take much. That's what he does. So keep them coming. That's what we want. All right, come on, let's sing this out. Cause the exciting news with you guys um, we wrote a song years ago actually during the pandemic called tomorrow and this song we've been singing it as a church we recorded it we put it out on all streaming platforms and a group of radio promoters heard the song and they said we believe this song has got to be literally promoted all over the world on radio so on October 27th October 27th Central Live is releasing our next radio single, the song Tomorrow. 
You guys excited about that? So I wanted to sing it with you guys. Let's continue to lift up our voices. Let's thank God for all he's done in our lives. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. I'm just thankful for today. We got you with me then. You'll lead me through again. If you won't take away my faith, come on and sing this out. church we've got a great God don't we give it up for Jesus this morning come on hey and give it up for yourself for being here come on we're so thankful for every one of you huge shout out to all of our first-time guests help me welcome all of our first-time guests will you church hey we want you to know you're in a place where it's okay to not be okay you can sit back you can relax we want you to feel at home here in fact we hope one day you would call this church home we don't want anything from you we want a whole lot for you and if you got a moment right after our experience drop off to new to central we want to say hi we want to get to know you a bit and we want to give you a gift from our family to your family but help me celebrate all of our first time guests one more time hey coming up in two weeks is fall fest weekend it's one of the best weekends of the fall we are expecting and hoping and praying for several hundred first-time guests. This is where we could use your help, okay? 
We want to get the word out all over Vegas about Fall Fest weekend. We're going to give out free pumpkins and all kinds of food and fun happening that weekend. We are looking for a thousand invite packets taken this weekend. Our team said, there's no way you could challenge the Central family and we'll give out a thousand. I said, you don't know our people. They'll raise their hand and make this happen. If you want to be an ambassador on the Fall Fest invite team, just raise your hand up really big and say, I'm in. You'll hand these out to friends and family and get this church. We're praying for over 700 first time families to show up that weekend alone. You can also scan the QR code onto the screen that will take you to some collateral where you can post about Fall Fest on your social media platforms. We wanna get the word out all over Vegas and impact people in a powerful, powerful way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being willing to make a huge difference. You can also pick up invite cards as you exit this morning. Well, thank you for doing that. I see several hands up, keep them up. Our team will find you. Hey, something we haven't done in quite some time and I really miss because I think it speaks to the friendliness of our church is allowed you to welcome those around you. Say hi to those around you. I'm gonna ask you to stand, say hi and welcome those around you. Then you can grab a seat. Awesome, awesome. If you didn't get an invite packet, make sure you just stop off in the lobby. Our team will make sure you get one after our experience. Hey, help me welcome my friend Gail this weekend, will you? I can't wait for you to hear her story. It's incredible, in fact. It was about six years ago she was living in Phoenix and really feeling like God was leading her to a change in her life. She began to pray about opportunities and put on uh, in for a request for a job transfer to Las Vegas. And as she was praying about that move, she also knew she needed a new start with God. And her sister-in-law told her about a church where she had heard the pastor speak in Southern California and said, I know of this church, it's Judd Wilhite's the pastor there, and it's this church called Central. And she knew in her heart, maybe there was something special to that invitation, so she showed up on her own and get this church, when she walked through the doors of this church, she knew she was home because of the friendliness level of this place. She felt so welcome, so loved, went on a tour and people were just saying, uh, we're glad you're here, this is a place you're gonna be able to call home. And she hasn't left since because of the friendliness of you. <laughs> and I hear that all the time, Gail. I hear that from so many people. They just love this place because it's so life-giving and so friendly. And I know when you showed up, you were in desperate need of a new start. You had lots and lots of debt. You had lots of anxiety. You had a lot of pressures going on in your life. And then God just began to untangle all these things and put his hand of favor and blessing on your life. Tell us about your story. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I love my church. Um, when I first came to Central, I take, took that first step, which is the class first step. And in first step, I had the opportunity to become a generosity rock star. And it's amazing just making that one commitment, that one step where that took me. In that same class, before I even graduated, God brought my future husband into my life. Whoa, <laughs> come on, that's awesome. And guess what? He was debt free. Whoa, a real gift. <laughs> <laughs> and so here I am now like, wow, I'm really doing this. And he held my hand through the whole process. And I was so blown away because I had held on to things <clears throat> to give me joy. You know, I had my fancy car, I had all my stuff. I had a shopping addiction and you know, all these things to try to make myself feel good. And all of a sudden I was like, let's go trade in this car. I don't want this anymore. You know, I was released from that. And instead of trying to get joy from those things, which wasn't satisfying, I was slowly being filled up with real joy. Wow. And only Jesus can provide, right? That's beautiful. Well, I know your anxiety peeled away. You've had this peace going on in your life. You're now right with God. You're walking with him. Tell us the blessings that you've received as you've journeyed now with Jesus all these years. 
so many blessings. I could be here all day. <laughs> they keep coming. And first of all, I would say, of course, having a wonderful relationship and husband. Second, this church community, all the friends I've made, the people I get to serve with, the opportunity to be in this place. My heart keeps changing. My job has improved. I mean, relationships with others, but a lot of it is that heart change and that joy and that peace and being released from depression. That is a very scary place to be for those who have experienced it, and I just didn't know the way out. And God has shown me the way out and continues to do so. Wow, that's beautiful, Gail. We're so thrilled that you've experienced that. So appreciate the way you serve on our generosity team, the way you bless others, the way you receive people into your life. Thank you for your own generosity and the difference you're making in people's lives here in the Central Family in Las Vegas. We're very, very thankful you're part of our family. Aren't we, church? Help me celebrate, Gail, this weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gail. You know, I just love that story because it's generosity that changed her life, and it's your generosity that allowed us to impact her to begin with. You know, one of my favorite times of the year is this time of year. It is cooler weather, and it's favorite for that reason for sure, but it's also a favorite time of the year because it's the holidays. I mean, if you go to the mall, it's already Christmas is on. And I'm reminded as we turn the calendar on October 1st today of a group of people in our city that are the overlooked and the under-resourced. I say they're the economically challenged kids of our city. And every year, church, the Central Family steps up and we begin to focus on these kids' needs. And this year will be no different. We call it Hope for Kids. And this year, we're trying to make a three times impact into our community at Christmas time for these kids. We wanna go from helping 3,000 kids at Christmas to over 10,000 kids this Christmas. Are you with me, church? I think we can do that. And we're gonna do it in various ways, and you'll be hearing more about that in a couple weeks. But there's a few ways the Central Family might pray about partnering with these efforts already, okay? Pray about your own gift that God may lay on your heart to give. But in addition to that, if you are a business owner, or you're an influencer in a business, we would love to connect with you. I believe there's some opportunities for you and your business to be a part of helping these economically challenged children. Just stop off out in the lobby to New to Central. Nick, our community engagement director, will be out there. He'd love to talk to you about those opportunities. The second way you can engage is join the Hope for Kids peer-to-peer -peer fundraising team. Listen, we already had over 30 people sign up last night and said, I'll get in on this. What is it? It's like you set up, uh, I, I like to call it like a GoFundMe page, okay? We set up the page for you. It's web-based. All you have to do is join this team. We'll even give you the burbage to put it in your text message or in an email. You re reach out to your friends and family in your relational world and ask them to join you in one of the greatest Christmas causes in all of Las Vegas. And that's helping these economically challenged kids. Kids, get this, we heard this last year, hadn't celebrated a Christmas in over four years, church. We stepped up and we became their Jesus in their life and gave them a Christmas to remember. We want to do that, and this peer-to-peer -peer fundraising will allow for us to do this in even greater ways. I'm praying for over 200 people in the Central Family to scan that QR code, to step up and join my team. This is my team. I'm leading it. I won't leave you hanging. I'll teach you to what you need to do and how to go about it so we can be successful together. And when it's all said and done, get this. I'm praying this team alone will bless 7,000 kids in the city of Las Vegas this Christmas. Do you believe that can happen, church? Yes, I do too. I wanna thank you in advance for stepping up in a big way for kids this Christmas. Church, you're phenomenal. And your generosity spreads literally all over the Vegas Valley. I'm talking everywhere I go, they talk about your generosity. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being generous in the way you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, you can do so by going to central.family or see a generosity team member in the lobby. They'd love to help you make that gift. Well, let's go to God in prayer. Will you join me asking his blessing on our time? 
Well, Jesus, we pause right now and we just say thank you. Thank you that you're such an amazing God. And we come to you admitting that we need you. Every person here needs you right now. So as we worship you, I pray we'd set aside the things that would distract us and we would focus entirely on you, your goodness, your power, and your grace. Show up big as we worship you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Need to worship.
In the Old Testament of the Bible, 2 Kings chapter six, there's a story where a servant looks out early in the morning and he sees this army coming on the nation of Israel. And he goes and he wakes up the prophet Elijah and he says, what should I do? And Elijah says, do not be afraid for there are far more on our side than there are on theirs. And he prays in that moment, Elisha prays, God, would you open the eyes of our servant and help him to see that you are with us. And the Bible says that when the servant opens his eyes and looks out, he sees this band of angel armies beyond the hillside, these chariots and horses of fire, and God uses this band of angel armies to blind the enemy. My prayer for you today is that God will open your eyes to see there are far more on your side than on theirs. No matter what challenge, no matter what difficulty, there is far more on your side because God is for you. This last week, I was uh, talking to my son Landon. He had this opportunity to go down to California for the weekend and um, he said, you know what, Dad, I don't wanna go because I wanna be in church this week and church is my happy place. And there's nothing more exciting for me as a dad than to hear your son say, church is my happy place. And I wanna challenge you just to keep showing up every week and keep being here at Central, keep worshiping, keep praying. I believe that when you do, God can use your worship to impact your life and others as well. And I wanna take a moment today and pray for you. If you're going through a difficult situation, if you need God's help, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air, even if you're watching online or inside of the prisons, if I can pray for you today, just slip your hand. If you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I wanna encourage you to stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray. Let's ask God to do what only he can do. And as we pray today, I wanna to stop and reflect that today is a pretty significant day in our city as we recognize the October 1st tragedy that took place years ago. And I wanna pray that God would just continue to restore all that has been lost. God, right now we come before you and we lift up our friends to you. For those who are struggling, for those who are hurting, I pray today, Lord, that you would open our eyes and help us to know there are far more on our side than on the enemies. And Jesus, we, we don't lean on our own understanding. God, we acknowledge you in all of our ways and we pray, Lord, that you would just do what only you can do in our lives. We let go in this moment. And Jesus, I also wanna pray for our city. God, just thank you for what you have done through such a horrible tragedy that took place, Lord, the community being stronger and all that you've rebuilt. But Lord, we don't wanna lose sight of what took place. I pray for safety over our city. I pray for safety over our first responders, over the, our elected officials and all those who serve our city so well. Jesus, I pray that you would watch over us and continue to rebuild all that has been lost. For it's in your name we pray. And everyone said together. You can do no wrong, for you are holy. All you do is love and show mercy, just as we are.
joining us and for worshiping with us today. Shout out to all of our central locations, especially that Sunrise Mountain location. We love you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And to the men and women joining us inside prison facilities around the country through our partnership with God Behind Bars, we are so thankful that you are part of the Central family as well. Yes. And Nikki, we've been in this series. It's been an awesome series called oh, Chasing right. Happy. And the whole idea of Chasing Happy came from Pastor Lori, who wrote a study around Philippians. It's an amazing study. But today, we get the opportunity of hearing from Pastor Lori herself. So give it yes. up big as she comes to bring us a message of hope. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys here. Is there any place better to be than together? Worshiping God, learning from Him, and doing it together. It's the best, right? I'm so glad you're here. Have you ever had a moment when you were rolling through life and then something came along and stole your joy? Have you had that moment? I have had those moments too. A while ago, I was speaking at a conference and before I go speak anywhere, I always like scour my closet looking for all my cute outfits because I wanna have a little boost of confidence before I walk on the stage. And so that particular day, I had decided to wear these really cute embroidered jeans that were totally destructed, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. I was feeling myself, y'all. And after wrapping up that conference, there was this girl who came up to me and she said, Lori, I have never loved you more than I do today. And I thought, that is so sweet. I was really moved. And I thought, before I could pat myself on the back, because surely I had said something that made like a huge impact in her life, she said, no, it's your niece. Now, that's weird, y'all. That is a weird thing to say to someone. And I thought, surely she must be talking about my jeans. They're so cute. I said, you're right. These jeans are so adorable, aren't they? And she said, no, it's that your knees, they're fat like mine too. <laughs> and I was like, what is happening? Now, I know what you're tempted to do right now because I'm wearing these jeans. You are tempted right now to see if she was right. Let me just tell you, she's right. There's, there's not a lot you can say to someone when they are acknowledging a truth to you. 
And um, I just wrapped her up in a big hug because we fattening girls got to stick together. And, and <laughs> unfortunately, since that day, I have not been able to discover any knee exercises to help me with this problem. I have not found any knee spanks to help me out. So I decided to retire those cute jeans when I was Marie Kondoing my house, you know? And I picked them up and I asked myself, does this spark joy? And they did not. They sparked insecurity and self-doubt, and if I'm honest, like a little bit of hurt. So I thanked them, and then I gave them away to spark joy in some skinny knee girl's closet. And isn't that just like life? We've got some happiness and we've got some joy and then suddenly we encounter some tough challenge or maybe some harsh comments or maybe some kind of crazy insecurity that we have in our lives and we start to feel like our joy has been stolen. Maybe you've got some hurts that hold you back from doing what you want to do or being who you want to be and your joy has been stolen. Or maybe you've got really tough circumstances that have crashed into your life and everything feels like a mess right now. Your joy has been stolen. Or maybe you're carrying around the weight of these decisions that need to be made and, and you don't know where to go from here and you feel a little bit lost and your joy has been stolen. Or maybe your marriage is really struggling and you aren't connecting and you aren't communicating and your joy has been Stolen, or maybe your finances are really straining right now. You don't know how the bills are going to get paid, and you're stressed and you're terrified, and your joy has been stolen. Or maybe your kids, they're just like crumbling under the pressure of school and friends and busy schedules. And every parent knows that you are only as happy as your saddest child, and you feel like your joy has been stolen. And you have hurt and betrayal and fear and anxiety and disappointment and failure. And all of those things can come along and try to steal our joy. But God wants us to be full of gladness, full of delight, full of happy. And I have very good news for you today. God can restore the joy that's been stolen. That's what we're going to talk about today. So we've been in a teaching series called Chasing Happy, and on the weekends, Judd has been taking us through Philippians 4. And during the week, many of you have been going verse by verse with me through the entire book of Philippians through my new Bible study. And if you haven't had a chance to like jump into that, it is not too late. You can grab it at any time and sit down with your family or even just in your own time with the Lord and go through it. You can grab that workbook in the coffee shop or wherever books are sold. And in the cover, you find a code. It gives you access to all of my teaching videos. And then the workbook will help us walk through the scripture little bit by little bit and let it all soak into our lives. And all the proceeds from that go straight back to the ministry. So it's a good way to not only dive into the word, but to support the church. So what do we do when we encounter joy stealers, well, first, we have to cling to God's character. We've got to cling to God's character. So my birthday is coming up this week, and I am like, I'm inching, thank you. <laughs> I'm inching closer to a birthday with a zero at the end. Do you know what I mean? And Judd, on a regular basis, will like offhandedly say like, well, since we're both in our 50s, and I'm like, hang on just a second, mister. <laughs> One of us is in his 50s, and the other of us is clinging to her 40s, and I'm not giving it up until I like cross that line. And it's not that I mind getting older because it's better than the alternative, if you know what I'm saying. But in my heart, I'm still clinging to my 20s until I'm around people in their 20s, and then I realize I'm not in my 20s. Clearly not in my 20s. And when people say 20 years ago, in my head, I immediately think they're talking about the 80s. But guys, that was 35, 40 years ago. So if you also were thinking about the 80s, you were also clinging to your younger self, just like I am clinging to mine. And by clinging, I don't mean just like trying to hold on to, I mean like white knuckled, iron fisted get death grip on trying to be and feel younger, at least in my own mind. 
And I wish that in my life, I held on to things with that kind of tenacity. But here's the truth. When I hear like ugly gossip going around, I let go of my happiness. And when criticism starts to flow my direction, I loosen my grip on my gladness. And expectations rise and anxiety appears and I release delight and I release rejoicing because I've been holding too tightly to the circumstances that are going on around me instead of clinging to the character of God. Now here's what Paul says starting in verse three of the first chapter of Philippians. And when we get to this red word, I want you to yell it out with me because this is God's word, the Holy Bible. We wanna get it not just into our heads but all the way down into our hearts so we wanna interact with it, are you ready? I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with what? I always pray with joy. So Paul planted this little church in Philippi about 10 years before he wrote this letter to them. And he thanks God for them. And he, every time he thinks of them, he prays with joy. So you would think that Paul must have had an incredible, amazing, uplifting experience when he was in Philippi. But all we know about Paul's time there is found in Acts chapter 16. So let me give you just like a really quick recap of that chapter. Paul is traveling around, he's a missionary, he's traveling with his buddies Silas and Timothy and Luke. Luke is who wrote the book of Acts. So Luke is giving us a firsthand account of what Paul is up to. And one night, Paul gets a vision from the Lord that he is supposed to go and preach the gospel in Macedonia. So they hop in a boat and they find their way to Philippi, which is like the leading city in the area. And when they arrive, Paul is ready to go. He doesn't wanna waste any time. He wants to start sharing the good news of Jesus with the people who are there. And the Bible says that the Lord opened the heart of a woman named Lydia. And Lydia and her entire household get baptized. So things are looking pretty great for Paul and Philippi. And then Paul and Silas pick up a new kind of follower, a demon-possessed slave girl who could predict the future. And she followed them around and she shouted, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. And even though what she's saying is true, Paul is getting pretty annoyed. He didn't ask for her endorsement. That is not the kind of Yelp view he wants. And so he says back to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And it does. So things are pretty amazing for Paul. And he thinks back on his time in Philippi with great joy. People are meeting Jesus. They're getting baptized. Like people are getting rescued from demons. Lives are being completely transformed. But not everybody's happy about it because the owners of that girl realize their money-making days are over and they are furious. So they have Paul and Silas arrested and they order him, them to be stripped, severely beaten by rods and thrown into prison. So they are bruised and they're broken and they're humiliated and they're in chains but still somehow they summon up the energy to sing songs of worship even while they're in prison. And then this huge earthquake comes along and chains break and the prison doors fly open. And in that moment, Paul and Silas are able to lead the jailer and his whole family to Jesus. So there are some really beautiful moments and there are some really brutal moments for Paul. Now here we are 10 years later, and he's writing this letter back to Philippi. He hasn't been there in a decade. So he could have thought back on his time, focusing only on the painful recovery from almost being beaten to death. Or he could have remembered the hurt he felt or the injustice that he faced, but that isn't what happens at all. Instead, he says, every time I think of you, I thank God and pray with joy. It tells us that Paul's joy wasn't anchored in the circumstances he encountered, not the good ones and not the bad ones. His joy was anchored in Jesus. Here's the deal. You and I, we can be tempted to anchor our joy in our life's circumstances, 
But joy isn't based in our current circumstances. It's based in the character of God. So instead of clinging to our circumstances, we have to learn to cling to his character. Because lasting joy is found in who he is and what he does. It's found in the attributes and the actions of God. So here are a few of the many, many attributes of God. First, righteousness, like, like the rightness of God. Sovereignty, he is in control and knows exactly what he's doing. He is power and strength. Nothing is too big, nothing is too much for him. He is grace and mercy and kindness. He is full of justice and truth. He is faithful, he is good, he is love. And when we stop and we take time to meditate on the amazing attributes of the Lord, there is a joy that starts to well up in our lives. And when we set aside being overwhelmed by the circumstances that we face and instead choose to be overwhelmed by the character of God, joy springs forth. But joy is also found in the actions of God. When you take a moment to think about all that God has done for you, you start to have some joy. He, cre he created you. He knit you together with his own hands. He chose you. Knowing all of your faults and failures, your weaknesses and your struggles, he chose to be in a relationship with you. He adopted you as his son or daughter, giving you his full inheritance. He walks with you through all the highs and all the lows of your life. He forgives you, provides for you, befriends you, pursues you, and blesses you. And when we look at all that God has done in our lives, we aren't overcome by the circumstances around us. We are overcome with joy because he's so good. He's good in and of himself and what he does is good. And that can bring us joy. So the first thing we do when we encounter joy stealers in our life is we cling to God's character. But next we have to also pursue our God-planted purpose. Pursue your God-planted purpose. Now I don't know about you, but I've had a few jobs in my life. I worked as a babysitter. I was a dirty dental tray cleaner. It was as gross as it sounds. And I was a spreadsheet updater, which I was terrible at. And I was a preschool teacher. And I did all of that really in pursuit of trying to find my purpose in life. And I think for a long time, I over mystified what a calling or a purpose looks like in my life. If it wasn't accompanied by like the voice of the Lord coming out of a burning bush, or if he wasn't using some like pretty stellar sky writing in the sky, I wasn't sure I had really been called at all. And so trying to discover our purpose can sometimes feel a little daunting in our lives. As we wrestle with the question of calling, the truth is we can start to doubt ourselves. Or maybe it's just me. But sometimes I get these whispers of insecurity that bounce around my mind like, do I, am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? Can I, can I even do what God is asking me to do? And if we are gut level honest, we don't just doubt ourselves, we start to doubt God's ability to use us at all. Can he create me for the path that he has laid before me? Does he have that ability? But when Paul wrote the book of Galatians, here's what he says. Starting in, let's see, chapter one, verse one. My authority for writing to you does not come from any popular vote of the people, nor does it come through the appointment of some human higher up. It comes directly from Jesus the Messiah and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Say it, I'm God commissioned. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are God commissioned. Now turn to your other neighbor who was not your favorite the first time and tell them you are God commission. <laughs> We're all God commissioned. The calling on your life did not come by some popular vote. There was no ballot casting ceremony. Your purpose wasn't decided by human appointment, including your own. You are God commissioned. And I believe 
that the purpose each of us has been created for has been burned in our hearts and written in our personal stories. So your purpose is God planted and God commissioned. And God can and will use that purpose for his good and for his glory. And that's one of the reasons I am so excited about our women's conference that's coming up here at Central. It's right around the corner. It's the Leading and Loving It conference. It's October 24th and 25th. And we're gonna be joined by women all across the country who are going to be flying in and joining us online from around the world. And these are gonna be women who are ready for a breakthrough a breakthrough in their lives, in their leadership, a breakthrough in their relationships and in their families, a breakthrough in their faith and in their spiritual lives. And this is a conference that we do every year and it would give me so much joy to have every woman that's part of our church to be part of this conference. And as part of the church family, you can attend at cost, like what it literally costs to put on. Um, And all you have to do is Go and use that code, Breakthrough, and it'll drop the cost down for you. And you can do that by registering at central.family. But here's the bottom line. We don't want to let anything stop us from letting God do a work in us so that he can do a work through us. So we don't let schedules hold us back. So if those dates don't work for you and you can't make those happen, guess what? You don't have to because when you join us online, you can not only live stream it, but you can watch it on demand for an entire year, which means you have plenty of time to watch it in your free time. And we also don't let money hold us back because thanks to a really generous donor, I have parts like full scholarships and partial scholarships to let anybody who wants to come be able to come. So all you have to do is reach out to any of the central team members or meet me and my team out in the lobby after the service or reach out to us by email. And we would love to help you come because I think it's that important because I have seen for 11 years now what God can do in people's lives in two days when we just let him invest in us for two days. So I hope you'll join us for that. Really my prayer is that all of us who are ready for a breakthrough in our lives will come for those two days and leave ready to pursue our purpose with like a fresh breath and a new sense of joy in our lives. Okay, back to Philippians. What is that purpose that we need to be pursuing? Look at what Paul says in Philippians 1, starting in verse 18. He says, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, what? Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. One of God's purposes is that Christ is preached, that the good news is shared, that people are shown the love and the grace and the mercy and the hope of Jesus. And when we pursue that purpose, we can rejoice because there is joy when we get to see lives changed, when their eternity is secured, when they become part of the family of God. But it does feel a little daunting, doesn't it? But what would you say if I told you that all of us are, well, we just have one job? As Christ followers, as as believers in Jesus, as those of us who are trying to pursue our purpose, we just have one job. Hidden right at the end of 1 Chronicles 16 in the Old Testament, there are 13 little words that when I read them, they changed my life and literally changed my perspective when it comes to purpose in our lives. So let me set the stage. King David has gotten the Ark of the Covenant back. He has brought it back to Jerusalem. And as he is kind of setting up what's going to happen in the church there, he's walking around the tent and assigning jobs to the people in the tent. Some of you are gonna be worship leaders. You guys are gonna play the drums. And you people over here, you're gonna be the trumpeters. And you guys are gonna be the security guards. And as he selects people, he says these words. With the job description, give thanks to God for his love never quits. So I'm gonna leave this up here for a second. Because what would happen, no matter our various occupations, if we were to fully live out that job description, give thanks to God for his love never quits. That means teachers and students, your job description is give thanks to God for his love never quits. Business owners and employees, your job description is give thanks to God for his love never quits. 
moms and dads in the room, you got one job, and your job description is give thanks to God for his love never quits. Hairdressers and dressmakers, you got one job, read it with me. Give thanks to God for his love never quits. I think you can do better than that. One more time. Give thanks to God for his love never quits. From college students to retirees, one job, job description. Give thanks to God for his love never quits. Delivery nurses, delivery drivers, you got one job description. Give thanks to God for his love never quits. No matter what you do, no matter where you work, your purpose, your job description is give thanks to God for his love never quits. And I don't know about you, but that I can do. And if we pursue that God-planted purpose, then God will restore the joy that's been stolen. So when we encounter joy stealers in our lives. First, we cling to God's character. Secondly, we pursue God, our God-planted purpose. And then last, we chase Christ. We have to chase Christ. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 10. It says, I want to what? One more time. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ, not just know about him, but to truly know him, to, to be intimately acquainted with him. I want to share a conversation with him. I want to be in his presence and let him see all the messes and the mess ups of my life. I want to share my day-to-day -day life with him and I believe he wants to share our day-to-day -day lives as well. I want to share in his experiences and have him be part of all of mine. I want, I want to actually know him, not just know about him, but to truly know him. In my own life, um, I have learned that rediscovering a relationship with Jesus leads to rediscovering joy. 27 years ago when Judd and I were dating, he sat our pastor down and asked him what he thought about us getting married. And our pastor said, Judd, your wife will make you or break you in ministry. And as a 20-year-old girl, I was horrified at the thought that I might break Judd's ministry. Now, I didn't focus on the front part of that statement that said I could make his ministry through encouragement, through teamwork, through our partnership. I solely focused on the fact that I could break his ministry and it scared me to death. And then right around that same time, I had two pastors at our home church call me into their offices to discourage me from marrying Judd. And one said that my personality was gonna have to change too much to be a pastor's wife. And he didn't think I should do that. I should keep being myself. But if I was gonna be a pastor's wife, that role required a different personality than the one I had. So I was not gonna be qualified to be a pastor's wife. The other pastor told me that if I was gonna marry Judd, I would need to get in the background. That my too muchness was going to hinder Judd and hurt his ministry. So I would need to learn how to tone it all down and get out of the spotlight. So people were not exactly lining up to tell me how great it was that I was gonna be joining Judd in his call to ministry. And so I started to just write all the things that I thought were weaknesses and faults and failures just down on a paper. The personality quirks I felt like I probably needed to change and I thought that if I was crystal clear about all of these things that maybe just maybe I could figure out how to keep from wrecking my husband's ministry. And I lived like that for almost a decade of our marriage. I let all of these expectations steal my joy. I couldn't be myself because what if that wasn't good enough? And I couldn't share my struggles because what if people couldn't handle them? And so I sat in this teeny tiny little prison I had made for myself, falling deeper and deeper and deeper into discouragement. And then about 22 years ago, 
baby girl in tow, we packed up a U-Haul and we moved from Texas to California. And we were 1,200 miles from our family. And I was lonely and overwhelmed by insecurity and overcome by a whole lot of fear. And out of nowhere, depression just plunged me into darkness. It literally, it literally felt like the lights had gone off in my life. And no matter how much I groped around looking for the light switch to turn the lights back on, because I, I desperately wanted them to be back on. I, I couldn't find it. Like I wanted light to get flooded into my life again, but I couldn't figure out how to turn the lights on. So for the better part of two years, I lived like that. And I could put a smile on my face and I could walk through the lobby and everybody would have thought I was fine. But at home, I was, is not good. It was really scary. And through the support of my husband, finally talking about everything that was going on in my heart and in my mind and the sheer mercy of Jesus, I was able to battle back to joy and to light. And that was the story I told of God's rescue from depression that I told for years. The struggle I used to have, the, the hardship I once faced, the darkness I had been delivered from, it was all in the past. And then about 18 months ago, out of nowhere, the lights just went off again. And I don't remember ever being as tired as we were in that season. We had been running super hard. We were trying to help a lot of people and leading strong and frankly, trying to carry the church like it only depended on us. And I was chasing significance and I was chasing impact and I was chasing fulfillment and I just kept coming up dry and I had this desolation in my soul. And I remember one day waking up one morning, not sure that I could get out of bed. And I spent a lot of time sitting in silent rooms, dark rooms, just staring at walls. And I know Judd was scared and I was terrified because I knew what was happening and I knew those feelings and I just kept begging God, I don't think I can do this for two more years. I don't think I can do it again. And like Judd shared last week, we sat down with our counselor and she said, I just want you to do one thing every day, one thing that will bring you joy. And one thing doesn't sound like a lot until you can't get out of bed. And then one thing feels impossible. It feels overwhelming. So Jed and I just started with a walk. Every day we'd get out and we would go for a walk and we would talk about the things that made us sad. And we would talk about what we hoped for and what we felt like God was up to. And we, we just talked a lot. And like step by step and little bit by little bit, it brought us joy. And then Judd would take me to thrift stores and flea markets because other people's trash is truly my treasure. <laughs> and it brought me a little bit of joy. But the biggest thing I did every day was I just sat and rested with Jesus. And I discovered that I had been so busy with the doing that I had missed the dwelling. I had been so consumed doing, 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 doing for Jesus that I had missed all of these moments of dwelling with Jesus. And I would sit in my chair with my Bible and I knew that God was talking to me there. I knew he had written that letter for me, just like he's written it for you. And some days I would read a lot. And then some days I didn't have really any energy to read much of anything. So I would set it on my chest and pray that God would like soak it in osmosis style, like get it in there. And as we spent time together, Judd and I, and I spent time with Jesus, I started to fill back up, fill back up with energy and purpose and joy because God was restoring the joy that had been stolen. And that's how he turned the lights back on in my life again. And it didn't come on all at once. It wasn't. It, it wasn't like he flipped a switch. It was more like God took hold of a dimmer switch and just little bit by little bit by little bit, the light started to come 
back on. It didn't mean there weren't still hard days. There's still hard days now. It just means that on the hard days, I'm choosing to chase joy and chase Jesus. And that makes all the difference. So I don't know where you're at in your life right now. Maybe you're facing difficulties that feel overwhelming and discouragement that seems impossible to overcome. Maybe the lights feel like they have just gone out. As you start chasing Christ, I believe that God will take hold of the dimmer switch in your life and just start to turn the lights back on little bit by little bit and bring joy back into your life. Or maybe you're in like a great season in your life right now. There's joy in your heart and light in your life and I'm so happy for you. But I'm confident that as you keep clinging to his character and pursuing his purpose, that God will still take hold of your dimmer switch too and he'll turn it all the way up. Because I do believe God can restore the joy that's been stolen. If you have never made the decision to chase Christ with your whole heart, start to follow him with your whole life. I just wanna give you that opportunity today. It's really just an opportunity to invite Jesus into your heart and to let him start doing the transformational work in our lives. So I'm just gonna ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if that's you and you want to start chasing Jesus. Maybe for the very first time, maybe you just need to start chasing him again. I wanna invite you to pray this prayer after me. You can say it out loud, you can say it in your own heart, in your own mind, but just pray, dear God, I thank you for loving me. In my mess and in my mess ups, thank you for restoring my relationship with you through Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins and I believe he rose again in victory. Forgive me for all my sins. Give me the gift of a life with you forever and help me face all the challenges I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. And while everybody's heads are bowed and they're eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand? This is really between you and God. I think it's important for us just to reach out to him physically, to say, God, today I'm gonna start chasing you. I'm gonna chase you even when it's hard. I'm gonna chase you even when it's painful. I'm gonna chase you and trust you. I see your hands all around the room. And for all of us, I just wanna pray over you for a second. And just say, Jesus, we, we love you. We are so thankful for who you are and thankful for all you do, but we just acknowledge that even in all of our blessings, God, there are things that come along that steal our joy. And we just ask you today, as we go into this next week, this next month, throughout the rest of this year, God, that when those moments happen, you'll help us just cling to your character, that we'll just let go of whatever's happening around us and instead we'll cling to who you are because you're good and your grace and your mercy. And I pray that you help us start to pursue our purpose, God, with like a, with a fresh sense of who you are, that we'll just start living our lives by giving thanks to you because your love, it surely does endure forever. And more than anything, I, hope, I just pray that you help us chase you. We chase a lot of things in our lives, God, but let the first one be you. And as we chase you, and as we dwell with you, just remind us that in all the doing, to not miss the dwelling with you. We love you, we trust you, amen.